When we walk with God, inevitably we'll get to a point where we are doing what we believe God would have us do, and it just doesn't seem to be going properly. Like you, you get to a point where, where you're doing what you feel like is obedience to God and it just is hard and it's not easy. And, and it's like, God, why is it hard when I'm obeying you? And Peter learned this. Like we saw, we've seen and we're going to see again and again that Peter's life was an experience of difficulty in his stumbling forward for God. And if you read his letters, like you see a major theme in his letters is suffering as a Christian. You know, in my own life, even, uh, like you guys know the story of us coming here. We, we, so many things were lining up. We really felt like, we still feel like God called us into this and, and he's leading us, he's going before us, he's uh, just creating such great circumstances. And then we get here and we're trusting and believing that God had a house for us. And we thought, okay, we're not going to have to rent. And we, you know, we were looking and we were praying and people were praying and, and no house. And, you know, we moved out of one temporary rental into another and we're, we're praying and we're waiting and no house. And it's like, God, why, why did you bring us all the way to this point and not do that when it seems like you were making us ready for that. Or uh, even in a, a smaller example, this past week, this past weekend, we were, you know, hanging out at home and all of a sudden Mandy feels like, okay, it, it's time. We got to go to the hospital. And so we go to the Invermeer hospital and the doctor comes and checks her out and says, yep, you, you got to go right now. You're going to Cranbrook. And so we drive to Cranbrook at late at night and we get there at near midnight and we're admitted and it's like things, you know, are progressing. And then you know, we try to sleep that night and the next morning, okay, not much has changed. And then we're there all that. And then we, all that day, we get into the evening and the doctor says, oh, you know what? Not much has changed. Let's see what happens. And we're there another night. And in the morning, the doctor says, well, you know what? Not much has changed. So we're going to send you back. And here we are like, God, what are you doing? We're waiting for this baby. We, you know, Mandy's been on bed rest and, and God, what is going on? We're driving home and it's confusing. And it's like, God, why is this so difficult? Why are things difficult? And I don't tell you those stories to say like, hey, oh my goodness, it's so hard for us. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not looking for, for people to feel bad for us. I'm just sharing that to say that we all have these experiences where circumstances in our life seem pointless like they're not doing anything like why did they happen why did that have to be hard unnecessarily and we get all these emotions and we get all these questions god why do these things happen to us and then we continue on in the life of peter and we see that jesus is doing something jesus is doing something in peter and jesus is doing something in us and so today we're going to look at peter walking on water and uh, I just want to read before that, we're going to read the, the previous story. And that's in looking at Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start reading in verse 13. So if you want to grab a Bible to see what's going on, you can do so at Matthew chapter 14. This is starting in verse 13. When Jesus heard about this, that is the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. When even came, the disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted, and it's already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. But we, we only have five loaves and two fish here, they said to him. Bring them here to me, he said. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took up the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up twelve baskets full of leftover pieces. Now those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children." Powerful story. And you ask, wait, didn't you say we're talking about Peter walking on water? That's a different story. Well, yes. I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. Because 
you need to know when you're reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you need to watch out for how things are ordered, how things are put in place. Because, you know, if you come to the Gospels and you say, oh, great, we have, we have four different kind of chronological biographies of the life of Jesus, and let's look at it, you're going to be confused because, you know, Matthew has something here and then the next story here and the next story here and then you go over to Mark and wait that story's back here and this story's up here and then you go to Luke and it's like oh well Luke has a different order too and John is like all different all together and and that's because the Gospels are not chronological biographies of Jesus that's not why they were written every author in writing the Gospels had a different purpose that yes they're sharing the Gospel they're sharing the life of Jesus but they're doing it for a certain purpose. So if we wanted to talk about Jesus as king or Jesus coming to bring salvation to the world or Jesus' miracles and what they mean for us as his followers, we're going to have a little bit of a different slant. And authors ordered their stories in ways to kind of show and teach what they were trying to teach. And so when you look at Matthew's order of these stories, you see that Matthew is building a clear thread in these passages. And when we look at this passage of the feeding of the 5,000, it sets up something for our passage uh, that, that really helps us to understand G Peter walking on water. And so when we look at uh, the passage of the feeding of the 5,000 that I just read, I want you to see something here. I want you to see that there's the, the people coming, right? Just like we saw with the fish, the people coming there, they want to hear from Jesus. They want to see what Jesus can do. And then there's this need, okay? They need to eat. When the, the disciples are confronted with the need, they realize that they don't have what it takes to fulfill the need, okay? They got to go away. And Jesus says, no, you do something. And they say, well, we don't have what we need to do that. And then Jesus, in that command, tells them, you need to fill this need. Do this. And again, they're like, we can't. But as they obey, we see a miracle that Jesus provides for the need. So we see a need. We see a lack. We see a command. We see obedience. And then we see a miracle. And Matthew starts this pattern, which isn't new. We, we, if you've read the Gospels, you've seen it earlier than this, and it's starting to build, and you're seeing it here again. There's this command plus obedience, which brings the miracle or the provision. And I want you to notice again, like I said last week, Jesus is working with his disciples in stages, right? He, he had the calling of Peter initially, where it was like, hey, you're going to be Peter. And then he had the, the miracle of the catch of the fish and it told him about his calling and he called him to follow him. And now we see that he's using Peter and the disciples to serve the world and to, and to fulfill needs and to do miracles. And it's like he's working with them in stages. It wasn't immediately like, hey, you go do this miracle. It's in stages. And, and that's how God works with us. You know, people are in stages. Maybe you are one of these people who, who's kind of new to the faith and you're like, well, I'm just kind of learning and I want to grow and I can't do a whole lot yet, but I'm learning and that's okay. You're in that stage. Or maybe you're not even there. Maybe you're a questioner and you're kind of like, yeah, I've heard about this or I grew up with it in my parents and uh, I'm kind of just learning. I don't really know if I believe yet. Or maybe you've passed that stage. You do believe and and now you're like, I know, I've learned, I've, I've grown deeper, and now I'm serving, I'm doing things for the church family, I'm doing things in the community. Or maybe you're in the stage of discipling, like, yes, I'm serving, and I know God, and I'm prayerful, and now I can help invite others and, and show them how to go through these stages. Whatever stage we're at, God works with us in stages, and, and it's just so clear to see in Peter's life how it's not, you know, ramped up, all of a sudden you need to be a super saint, but... But Jesus works in stages. So, so here they are at this stage where Jesus says, yeah, you go do this. Go fill this need. Go, go serve these people. And they can't, but they obey and Jesus provides. And what we're going to see in our story today is that we will always have what we need to obey. Listen, Jesus in any circumstance provides what we need to obey his command. And that's going to help frame our story, which is Peter walking on water. So if you'll continue to read with me in verse 22, Matthew 14, 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. 
After dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain to pray by himself. Well into the night, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from the land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. Jesus came toward them, walking on the sea very early in the morning. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, Have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him, and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, I want to just walk through this passage, and I want us to observe together what Jesus is teaching us. And so I hope you have your Bible because this works best if you watch along and see what's there. What we see as we start in this passage is, is there's this command. Jesus says, go, go, uh, go across the lake, you know, big freshwater lake, take a while to get across. He says, go and I will dismiss the crowds. And he starts to send people away. And, and this is kind of a weird place if you think about it because Hey, they're, they're building a following. There's crowds following them. People are, are coming. They want to be part of this revolution. And Jesus, why are you telling them to go away? But he does. He's, he's getting rid of the hype in a way. And yet, obviously, from Jesus' point of view, there were important things that he had to deal with. And so uh, he, he sends them away. And then it says he goes up to spend time in prayer. And this is an awesome example because think about it. Jesus was this man, who, the God man who was on mission all the time, right? God had all these purposes in the life of Jesus and the life of the disciples. And, and Jesus said, all that my father commands me, I do. All that I hear from my father, I do. And so in this, he needs to go and he needs to be alone. And, and when there are significant things happening, he needs to rest and be with his father and hear and you know, recuperate from the, the difficult news of John the Baptist being killed and all this. And he has this connection. And you will know it. It's good to know that as he went up on the mountain, when you're on the mountains around the Sea of Galilee, you can actually see a, a lot of the sea. And so as Jesus went up to pray, it's very likely that he can see the disciples take off and start making their way across the lake. And so, and then we get into verse 24, and it says that the disciples are um, straining. It says that they're, they're being battered by the waves. And actually, if you look in uh, Mark chapter 6, the same passage, the parallel passage, it says they're having a tortuous time. They're, they're grinding at the oars. Like this is, this is hard going. This is taking way longer than usual. And it's difficult. Like they're just having a tough time. It says, it says if you look at the Greek of this, it literally says they had gone many stadia. They, they had gone, it's, it may say in your Bible, a long way or when they were far from the land or whatever, but it says they had gone many stadia, and a stadion was almost uh, 200 meters. And so if you say many stadia, they, maybe they had gone two kilometers, three kilometers, who knows? Like, but they had been going for a while because it's, it was after dinner that Jesus sent them away. So maybe, I don't know, eight o'clock or or nine o'clock, and, and then it says Jesus met them between three and six in the morning. So listen, they had gone many stadia in about eight hours. So three kilometers of, of being battered by the wind and the waves of grinding at the oars, three kilometers or so in eight hours. Like, could you imagine if, if we got out on a boat and it took us eight hours to row over to Windermere from Kinsman Beach? Like, like they were just straining. It was difficult. They were, they were hard going. And, you know, we look at this and say, is there a pattern in the discipleship life with Jesus here? Because Jesus sent them. And then Jesus walks to them. 
Like he catches up to them walking on the water as they're rowing. He owns that water. He controls what's going on and he walks to them. And it says in verse 26 that when they see him walking on the sea, they were terrified, right? And think about it. They're tired. They're having a difficult time. They're frustrated and they're afraid. There's, they're in this storm. And all of a sudden something comes, they think it's a ghost, comes walking on the water and they cry out in fear. They're afraid. And, and then they hear the familiar voice. They hear the familiar voice that says, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then this interesting exchange where in 28, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, if it's you as you say it is, he says, command me to come to you on the water. So listen, Peter is is taking courage, just like Jesus said. Jesus told him, take courage, and, and he's testing. He's saying, okay, if it's you, Lord, do something only you can do. And, and listen, up to this point, Jesus has been working on this with Peter, on taking courage, on having faith. And Peter, we know, is zealous, right? He, he's like, okay, you're out there, Lord. I'm, I want to be sure it's you. And, and then we see this profound thing where Peter says, command me command me. He doesn't say, if it's you, I'm going to come out. He says, if it's you, command me to come out. Because listen, Peter knows that it's at the commands of Jesus that there's power. He has the right idea. He looks to the man walking on water and says, you're the one with the power. You're doing it. And I want to be with you. I want to be like you. I want to follow you. Where you go, I go. So tell me to go and I will go. That's, that's amazing. Like, would that even occur to you? Like, you see Jesus walking on the water. He says, don't be afraid. And you, your first thought is, okay, you're doing it. I'm going to do it. But this is Peter's faith. This is how he's zealous. And his thought is, if Jesus commands it, it'll happen. Right? Think back to the last story. Jesus says, we got to do it. It'll happen, even if it takes a miracle. So Peter saw the pattern here. Jesus commands, I obey, and it will happen. The impossible can happen. The miracles can happen. And so then, in verse 29, Jesus says the command. He says, come. Jesus says, do it. And if Jesus says, do it, then what do we have to fear? And so Peter, on this large fishing boat, climbed over the edge, uh, leaned down. The, the wind's there. The, the waves are big. And, and he's, at one point, he had to just jump off jump, no life jacket, no nothing, jump off, and he lands on the water. It's a miracle. The command of Jesus and Peter's faith brought a miracle. And I want to I wanna stress this, okay? It's not just faith that brought the miracle, right? We, we don't have faith in our faith, if that makes sense. You know, we, we have faith in the word of Jesus, in the command of Jesus. And sometimes people get this backwards, like, if I can just conjure up enough faith, then whatever I say will happen. Or, you know, oh, oh that didn't happen for me. I must have not had enough faith. That's, that's backwards. Faith is a response to hearing a command. We believe in what Jesus has told us to do, and we believe that if he commanded it, we can trust in him and do it. And that's where the power is. So, so the command was there, and Peter jumped out, just banking all on Jesus' command. And then in verse 30, we get the but. But when he saw the strength of the wind. When he saw. And, and ah, the, that is the thing, right? When we see, when, when I saw what it was like, or when I realized, or when I looked at my circumstance. It's, there, there's so much that can go wrong when we walk by sight and not by faith. When we try and live our lives according to, oh, that seems right. That seems, you know, this is how God should do it. Or that seems how it should be. When we walk in that way, so much can go wrong. And Peter jumped out in faith and then he saw what was going on around him. He saw the circumstances and it, it was more than he expected, right? It was, it, it was he looked around and, and saw what was going on. God, what's going on? Jesus, it's not easy. It, it, this isn't what I expected. Why isn't it easy? And it says he began to fear. Friends, 
We trouble ourselves when we don't believe in the word of Jesus. We bring difficulty on ourselves. And he got consumed with the danger. He got consumed with the missed expectations. He got consumed with the disappointment of, I thought it was going to be a certain way, apparently. And, and he wasn't focused on Jesus and on Jesus' command to him. And it says, he began to sink. And right there, that's, that's the gentleness of Jesus on display. That's the mercy of God, right? He began to sink. Have you ever tried to walk on water? I have. And when we were kids, we used to do this thing where we'd like run onto the water and see how many kind of steps we could take in the pool. But listen, you don't begin to sink. You, you go right in. You plop down into the water and, and all of you is under before you know it. But it says... He began to sink. Like the mercy of Jesus is that he didn't just let him go, but he let him sink. It wasn't easy. He feared, and Jesus let him sink. But he has time to cry out to Jesus, to cry out to the one with the power. And you see the sinking, this slow sinking as Peter cries out was a blessing. Really, it was, it was the mercy of God. It was a lesson for him because Jesus comes in and rescues him. And as he rescues him, he asks him a question. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And, and we might say, hold on. Peter just jumped out of a boat in the middle of a lake in a storm and walked on water at your command. That's little faith? But he gave in. He gave in to what he saw. He, he jumped in by faith, but he didn't walk by faith. And he gave in and he began to sink. And I want you to know, like when Jesus says this, this isn't an insult. He's not saying, oh, Peter, how could you have such little faith? It's not an insult. It's a lesson. He's saying to Peter, you didn't have to doubt. Why did you doubt? You didn't have to doubt. And I want you to notice, he, when it says Peter feared, Jesus says, you doubt it. You see, fear and doubt go hand in hand. When we're walking in the way of Jesus and we're afraid of, oh, you know, it, it might not go the way I expect, that's, in a sense, a doubt of Jesus. And, and again, this is not an insult. This is a lesson. This is training. Because what was Peter doubting? You see, he, he had the command of Jesus. He knew that if Jesus commanded it, it will happen. And that's why he asked Jesus to command it. He believed that it would happen. But he started to doubt that Jesus was able to carry him in his obedience. And, and you know what? I wonder if this is starting to hit you yet because for me, this is where it's hitting me. Like, like he was doubting that Jesus could carry him in his obedience. And Jesus says, why did you doubt? That is because Jesus will carry us as we obey. He will provide what we need to obey him. And so we see Jesus in his mercy pick him up, take him back into the boat, and the wind stops. And, and you say, why? Why then? Like, Lord, why, why not when it was hard? Why didn't you make the wind stop before I got out so I could have walked in faith? And that's because, listen, Jesus isn't about making things easier. Jesus isn't about making things easier in your life. He's about making you stronger about building your faith. He's not here like, okay, I'm going to come into your life, I'm going to take away all your problems, and everything's going to be easy. That's not how it works with Jesus. And if you think it, it does, you're going to have some serious disappointment. No, no, no. Jesus comes in, and he has the storm, and he has the circumstance, and he calls us into it so that our faith can be built in the storm. He's not about making it easier. He's about making you stronger and building your faith. And not only yours, look at this. In, the, in verse 33, it's actually building the other's faith as well. When they look at Peter and what happens to him and how he jumped out in faith and ended up sinking and Jesus rescues him, he's, he's building the other's faith as well. Okay, so don't devalue your struggles. Listen, your, your faith, your jumping out for Jesus, your sinking, your casting yourself on Jesus, his work in you and all of that, it can cause others to worship the Lord. It can build others' faith and help them to see who Jesus really is. So friends, don't hide your struggle. 
Don't hide your difficulty. Don't hide where you are in the storm because it can be so valuable for others. Jesus was revealing himself in Peter's experience. Peter's experience wasn't about showing unwavering faith. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but, but some people, you know, sometimes you feel like, well, if I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to show unwavering faith in any storm. And if my faith is wavering, then I'm a bad example. Like, some people think if they're going to be a good example, they have to have this perfect faith. Listen, it's not about being an example of perfect faith, but an example of Jesus building faith through the storm. You don't need to be that person who has perfect faith and is always smiling. You need to be that person whose life shows that through the storm, Jesus is working on you. Jesus is growing, growing you and Jesus is with you. And man, that's a theme of Peter's life. And so friends, we can rejoice because God is doing these things in our difficulties, in our storms. Big things are happening, but sometimes they're happening slowly. So from this story, when, when Peter gets out there and, and Jesus says, why did you doubt? We see that Jesus gives us what we need to obey. He calls us into something. When he commands us, he'll give us, he'll do what needs to be done, even when it's impossible. And so listen, for us, that means you can obey. Sometimes we look at the Bible and think, oh, there's all these things. I don't think I can do that. I don't have the gifts to do that. I don't have the strength to do that. I really can't handle this. I can't get out of these circumstances I'm in. Listen, you can obey. If God commands it, God will provide what you need to obey. So when God commands and we obey, that's where we'll see breakthrough. That's where we'll see our circumstances shifting and being used for him. That's where we'll see fruit. And that's where we'll see his faithfulness. And listen, again, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Okay? When we're weak, when we try to obey and we mess up and we begin to sink, he carries us. And that's useful for him too. But as he says here, you don't need to doubt. When Jesus calls you to something, you don't need to doubt. Because evidently, when we doubt, when we fear, when we question, we trouble ourselves. When we, when we try and go by what we see instead of by what he commands, we trouble ourselves. Listen, family, walking by faith will always work out better than trying to figure things out yourself. That, trying to figure things out yourself, that's the cause of anxiety. That's the cause of being fearful of the unknown. But when we, when we rest in him in faith and obey what he says to do, he'll give us what we need. And the beautiful thing is, as we do this, as we struggle forward and, and as we obey him and as we need him to pick us up, others will see and they will rejoice and they will know that he is the son of God. Church, listen, imagine if a hundred of us or, or even 50 of us, imagine if we just, we just heard this and we said, yeah, you know, I'm going to obey the commands of Jesus. I'm going to hear what he calls me to. Okay, I'm going to read his word. I'm going to seek him in prayer. I'm going to learn what he desires for the world. I'm going to listen to his voice and then I'm going to go. I'm going to step out and believe that he will provide. I'm going to boldly walk in his way and hearken to his call. Church, could you even imagine what God would do? Listen, Invermeer would witness the power of God. Okay, if we're, if we're believing in faith and walking in obedience, people will see. I'm telling you, people in our community who don't even know Jesus will be like, man, Jesus is at work in those people. It, it, people will come to our town for rest and renewal as they often have if it's ever allowed again. And, and they'll get more than they bargain for. They will get the rest and renewal of the gospel of Jesus. We'll see people get baptized. We'll see people sent to the nations. Because listen, it's no secret in the Bible that when, when God's people walk in obedience, we receive God's power. That's, that's true in the Bible, and, and we will see that. We will see that if we have faith and we step out and we listen to his voice and we obey. And we will see miracles, and, and the miracles won't just be physical miracles like walking on water, although I believe God still does things like that. The miracles we will see will be even bigger. We will see hearts changed where we thought that's impossible. That person will never change. My brother, my nephew, my mom or dad, they'll never come. They will come. 
because God will do impossible things. Families will be restored where we thought, oh, that's just too broken. And family, we are invited to be a part of that. So go this week knowing that when we are called to obey, God will give us everything we need to do that and to see the power of God.